Okay, we'll make a start. Welcome everybody, welcome to the event. Uh, my name is Stephen Young. Uh, I'm an Associate Professor of Geography and International Studies here at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I'm also the Faculty Director of the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center or IRIS NRC. And uh, we are the institution bringing this uh, event to you today. IRIS NRC supports and enhances global awareness and inspires informed thinking about the complexities of our world. And we provide resources and expertise to K-12 and post-secondary educators, as well as students and the community at large. Um, if you go to our website, irisnrc.com, you'll find lots of resources there and lesson plans, uh, previous events that we've uh, hosted, um, and lots of other good stuff about future things that are on our calendar. Thanks also to our co-sponsors for today's event. Uh, who are African Cultural Studies, the African Studies Program, and the Middle East Studies Program here at UW-Madison. And please do go check out their uh, websites and social media pages as well. Um, the tech support today is being done by Essie Lenchner. Essie, who has worked on uh, putting on three events in the last 12 days. I'm extremely grateful to her for all her work. If you have any challenges, um, please use the chat function to contact her. Uh, we will be, as you've probably seen, recording today's event and sharing this recording via an email with everybody who registered. But you will only show up on the recording if your microphone is turned on to speak. If, as we head towards the uh, latter stages of today's presentation, you have a question that you would like to ask, you can either wait until we move to the Q&A section, or you can also post it in the chat, and I will uh, ask the question on your behalf. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I would like to read the UW-Madison Land, Land Acknowledgement Statement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Job since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both federal and state governments repeatedly, but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. And today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk nation, along with 11 of the First Nations of Wisconsin. So on to the main event today. This is the third of three events that we've put on, uh, building up to the uh, World Cup, which will be kicking off on Sunday. And I'm delighted to say that today we are joined by our speaker, Peter Allegi. Peter is a professor of history at Michigan State University, and he also holds the title of Honorary Research Associate at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He is the author of several acclaimed books. This includes La Duma, Soccer Politics and Society in South Africa, and a book called African Soccerscapes, How a Continent Changed the World's Game. And I know that a number of students who are joining the event today will be familiar uh, uh, with uh, that book. It's one that I've been uh, using in a class that I teach on soccer. Uh, he's also the co-editor of the book, Africa's World Cup, and also South Africa and the Global Game. Professor Alleges' most recent work has been published in the Journal of S S Southern African Studies, the International Journal of the History of Sport and Radical History Review. And his writing has also appeared in edited collections, including Sports in Africa and Global Africa. And his current research projects include one that studies the role of digital technology in African history. I'm delighted that he's joining us today, particularly because uh, he's not in Michigan right now. He's in Rome on a well-earned sabbatical. Um, so it's also a little late in the evening there, but uh, Peter, I'll hand over to you and, and thanks again for making time for this. Thank you, Stephen, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Essie, for sorting out our tech. And um, hello to everyone in the audience. It's uh, yeah, about 9.30 or so here in Rome, and the first day of what is going to be, what, a seven-week pause in the football calendar or soccer calendar just began, and it is a time of mourning in Italy because Italy is not in the World Cup for the second consecutive time, something that had never happened in my lifetime. So um, tough times, but fortunately the U.S. is in the World Cup and, and so is Senegal. So those are the two teams I'll be supporting. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen now. And I've been asked to speak on the lessons and legacies of sporting mega events, particularly the Men's World Cup. 
uh, from South Africa 2010 to Qatar 2022. Now, obviously, in 35, 40 minutes, I can't do justice to each and every competition. I will focus on South Africa 2010 because I think there are some themes that carry over to the other competitions uh, up to the one that is going to begin six days from now. Now, most uh, American students in particular, but perhaps uh, in other areas of the world as well, when they hear the word FIFA, you will think probably of the great video game that has been a bestseller for many, many years. We're up to, uh, I don't know what edition this is, probably well into the 20s. And I want to show you just a, a, a blip from the official reveal trailer of the latest version of FIFA 23. Let's see if it works. Of course it doesn't. Uh, one, one can plan all sorts of things and then uh, the tech doesn't, doesn't back you up. But what, what I wanted to show you was that amazingly, you know, female players and male players are shown side by side in the trailer, uh, both uh, club teams and national teams. And that's an indication that, you know, the women's game has really developed in, in an incredibly vibrant way in the past few years, but also that in this trailer, almost all of the, the leading players at the beginning are all players of color. And I think there again, it suggests that players of African descent are increasingly uh, carrying the burden in a sense of representing the global game uh, in popular culture uh, in particular. Now, FIFA of course is not just a video game, FIFA is the world soccer governing body. It's an international nonprofit tax exempt organization based in this uh, very swanky headquarter in Zurich, Switzerland, where I once interviewed for a job to write the centenary history of the organization. I was offered the job, but then turned it down. And I think they've hated me ever since, which is okay. Um, and it functions essentially as a, a kind of network, as uh, John Sugden and Alan Tomlinson have put it, of, on the one hand, sports bureaucrats, uh, and then their partners, corporate sponsors in particular, and the media organizations uh, that feed the uh, FIFA trough. Now, the Men's World Cup is what I'm focusing on today, and it accounts for over 90% of FIFA's revenue. Most of that comes from the sale of broadcasting rights and, of course, commercial rights. Uh, in the last World Cup cycle, FIFA reported six and a half billion dollars U.S. roughly in revenue and claims it has over 2.7 billion dollars in cash reserves. Not bad, I would say, for a tax-exempt nonprofit organization. So how does South Africa fit into this story? Well, we have to go back to the years of Nelson Mandela's presidency, which started, of course, in 1994 with the first democratic elections after the end of apartheid. And Nelson Mandela was very fond of sport. In more than one speech, he said the following, sport has the power to change the world, it has the power to inspire, it has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. Sport can awaken hope where there was previously only despair. And in a country that had suffered under the shackles of apartheid, one of the most brutal systems of racial oppression uh, of the 20th century, this was particularly important. But it wasn't just that he was a canny politician, which he certainly was, and a great human rights activist and civil rights leader. Mandela himself was a, a former athlete. In his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, for example, he writes the following. It was not until I lived in Johannesburg that I took up the sport boxing in earnest. I was never an outstanding boxer. I was in the heavyweight division. Boxing is egalitarian. In the ring, rank, age, color, and wealth are irrelevant. When you're circling your opponent, probing his strengths and weaknesses, you aren't thinking about his color or social status. I never did any real fighting rights, Mandela, after I entered politics. My main interest was in training. I found the rigorous exercise to be an excellent outlet for tension and stress. And after a strenuous workout, I felt both mentally and physically lighter. It was a way of losing myself in something that was not the struggle. 
After an evening's workout, I would wake up the next morning feeling strong and refreshed, ready to take up the fight again. And so there was a personal passion for sport that I think alerted Mandela to its political possibilities. Now, Mandela, of course, spent 27 and a half years in prison fighting for freedom, democracy, and justice. The struggle was carried on outside of prison. And one of the main ways in which the struggle was fought against apartheid was through the sport boycott. This was a movement that really boosted the country's quest for freedom, the people's quest for political and cultural liberation. And I think until Colin Kaepernick uh, took a knee in 2016, and everything that came after it, the sport boycott against apartheid was quite possibly the most successful anti-racist campaign in the history of sports. I don't have time to get into all of the details. Perhaps if you're interested, you can um, ask about it during the Q&A. But in the early 1990s, as Mandela was released from prison and the negotiations began between the white minority and the, uh, mainly the African National Congress, Mandela's party, the boycott ended. And it was basically a reward, a carrot, if you will, uh, to the white minority for agreeing to embark on the political negotiations that ended apartheid in 1994. And in 1992, South Africa sent a team to the Barcelona Summer Olympics for the first time since 1960, a team that was 80% white, many observed, and it didn't have uh, the South African flag to fly, but rather they flew the Olympic flag and no national anthem, but used Beethoven's Ode to Joy. So this marked the re-entry of South Africa into international sport. Now, why did Mandela believe so strongly in, in sport? Well, it had a lot to do with the fact that a new national identity had to be created essentially out of the ashes of apartheid. And as Eric Hobsbawm famously wrote, the imagined community of millions seems more real as a team of 11 named people. The individual, even one who cheers, becomes a symbol of his nation himself. And so sport could help build a rainbow nation in the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. This whole process was really made famous by the Invictus film that Clint Eastwood put together based on a book written by the journalist John Carlin entitled Playing with the Enemy, in which Nelson Mandela embraced the almost completely white Springbok rugby team uh, led by Francois Pinar, who was an ANC sympathizer, interestingly. And um, there's Mandela about to give the uh, World Cup trophy in 1995 at Ellis Park in Johannesburg to Francois Pinar after the Springboks defeated uh, the New Zealand All Blacks in uh, overtime, 15 to 12. It was a moment in which essentially, you know, what Mandela was doing was embracing conservative, even right-wing whites and saying, you know, you belong in this new South Africa. Uh, it's hard to really impress upon an American audience how uh, the Springboks were really sort of the ultimate symbol of apartheid, but they were. It would be kind of like Alabama football in the 1940s and 50s as the civil rights movement uh, took off. Oops, this. there we go. A few months later, having won the Rugby World Cup at home, the uh, South African national team won the African Nations Cup in soccer. And there again, Mandela wearing the uh, national team jersey. Uh, you can see the Zulu King Zuelettini is there, the former state president uh, who had just become vice president, F.W. de Klerk, who shared the Nobel Prize in 1993 with Mandela's there, Isa Hayatou on the right, uh, leader of African football from Cameroon, and Steve Chuete, who was the minister of sport and former organizer of sport in prison uh, on Robben Island, is there with the white captain of South Africa, Neil Tovey, a man I, I interviewed in a, a few months before that competition while I was doing my research for my first book. And uh, Toby said about that victory that while the Ru Rugby World Cup was about the whites in our country with some integration, with the Africa Cup of Nations, it was exactly the opposite. It was probably 98% of the nation behind us with the remaining 2% completely unaware that this tournament was even happening. 
The Springboks definitely kicked it off. That's the rugby team. And they gave us immense, immense inspiration. But the effect was small compared to what Bafana achieved. We were touching everyone's lives. And so rugby and, and soccer and several other sports were really elevating rainbow nationalism uh, to the forefront. And it is this uh, belief that sports could advance a political agenda of unity and peace and diversity in, in post-apartheid South Africa that led South Africa to launch a bid to host the World Cup itself. Uh, they tried to host the uh, 2006 competition, but narrowly lost out to Germany, and then uh, won the right to host the 2010 competition, uh, which was awarded in May of 2004. And Nelson Mandela, who was not traveling almost at all by then, made the flight out to Zurich to the FIFA headquarters, and he wasn't the only Nobel laureate in attendance. You can see here in this photograph, moments after the announcement, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, 1984, Nobel Peace Laureate from South Africa was also there and they're uh, crying tears of joy and Mandela uh, said he felt like a young boy of 15. This is serious stuff for somebody, you know, who was arguably the most famous political prisoner of uh, the post-war world and someone who spent, uh, again, almost three decades in prison for his beliefs and in the fight for freedom and, and democracy in South Africa. So the 2010 World Cup comes with all this political and symbolic history. Uh, the government transformed it into a really important national political project. Many have argued that this was the most um, well-conceived and, and, and richly funded national effort since the 1994 democratic elections that finally buried apartheid. And I think there's uh, reason to, to support that view. And the second main thrust of the project was that the democratic South African government wanted to sell the idea of a kind of brand South Africa. They even had a statutory body called the International Marketing Council created to support the selling of this brand South Africa to the world. Uh, what is brand South Africa? Essentially stripped to the bare bones, the idea that South Africa is a democratic a modern nation, business friendly, and a kind of attractive, if not exotic, tourist destination. The, the extent to which it was, a, it was a national project can be seen in the fact that the host cities were spread around the country. Eight of the nine provinces were represented in an attempt by the government to bring the game to as many people and as many regions as possible. But South Africa didn't just see itself uh, hosting the World Cup as a national project. I think it can be argued pretty convincingly that it saw itself as a representative of the entire African continent. At the time, Thabo Mbeki, the president who succeeded Nelson Mandela and who was really the main architect within government for the bids, really was pushing this idea of, of the African Renaissance, the notion that you know, Africa's modernity could be combined with its uh, traditional cultural uh, dynamism, you know, to move the continent and its people forward. And if you look at the iconography of the tournament, this does come through pretty clearly. You look at the official logo of the tournament, right, and Africa is in a different colored font. Uh, furthermore, the kind of uh, sun rock painting style of the overhead kicker who's, who's at the center of this, you know, harkens back to the idea that Africa is the cradle of humankind, and South Africa is represented in that. But also the outline of the map of Africa uh, is clear, and the colors, uh, green, yellow, black, and red, typical of African national flags, are also represented. So South Africa saw itself as an African host nation. And this also is seen in the official poster which is the outline of the map of Africa, again, with the profile of a player that is suspected to be Samuel Eto'o, the great striker from Cameroon, although the organizers never admitted as much. There's a, there's a striking similarity there. And I think it's a subtle way in which, again, or maybe not so subtle, that uh, the South African organizers were trying to represent the continent, but also maybe a little more subtly uh, putting themselves forward as kind of the leaders of this African Renaissance. The official slogan of the World Cup was Kinako, now is the time in Sesotho. And 
uh, celebrate Africa's humanity was everywhere on the merchandise and on posters and billboards. Now, I always kind of chuckled at this because when Germany had hosted the tournament four years earlier, you didn't see signs saying Germ celebrate Germany's humanity, even though that was there was a political agenda in hosting that tournament. Uh, in Brazil in 2014, you didn't see celebrate Brazil's humanity. But again, it speaks to a couple of things. One is that there are negative stereotypes connected to African people on the African continent that were being challenged by South Africa's hosting of the tournament. Um, but also look at the fact that Celebrate Africa's Humanity is trademarked. And so, you know, there's there's a, you know, uh, this contradiction here of, you know, a, a humanistic uh, vision clashing with its commodification. So the World Cup was a success. I think most will agree. The organization was efficient. Uh, the stadiums were excellent. The security top notch, especially after 44,000 police officers were hired uh, or, or put in action, I should say, in service after uh, some of the uh, contractors walked off the job in the second day of the competition. The accommodation was good if overpriced, as often happens in these events. And the transportation system was enhanced and functional with some uh, very important investments in uh, the telecommunications infrastructure, particularly enhanced broadband. So, uh, FIFA was extremely happy with the bottom line in its uh, financial report, claimed that they had earned 2.3 billion uh, US dollars in profits tax-free as per the uh, contract that South Africa and all host nations have to sign with FIFA, and they sold 97.5% of the tickets. What was the impact on South Africa itself? I would say that there were positives and there were negatives. On the positive side, I think brand South Africa was globally marketed for about a month, and doing so, I think effectively challenged these negative images of the continent and African people in general. Within South Africa, you saw, and I'll show you an example of this in a moment, you know, very strong feelings of national pride and, and unity across racial and, and class and, and gender lines. And in a country struggling with xenophobia uh, since uh, you know, the end of apartheid with particularly caused by local reactions against uh, immigration from other African countries, not just within the Southern African region, but from the Horn uh, and from West Africa as well. You know, the fact that South Africa was hosting the World Cup, uh, including African teams, uh, did reinvigorate feelings of unity across the continent. Now, uh, this advertisement that you see here was very typical of what you saw in newspapers and, and on television during this time, you know, the South African flag, and this is one of the main banks in the country, FNB, saying today, this is the greatest country in the world. Another symbolic strategy that was used was to repurpose casual Fridays into football Fridays. And so instead of wearing your casual clothing to work on Friday, uh, South Africans were encouraged in January of 2010 to start wearing football shirts. And it started off when I arrived in January of 2010 for my Fulbright year in South Africa. Uh, talk about good timing. The trend was to wear sort of a combination of local club jerseys like Kaiser Chiefs, Orlando Pirates, uh, Sundowns, Amazulu, and so on, with, you know, the glamour clubs, Real Madrid, Manchester United, uh, Barcelona, um, Juventus, etc. But then by about April, right, so about two months before the competition, almost as if a memo had gone out to the nation, which I don't, I never saw evidence that it did, but almost like a switch was, was, Flicked, and everyone started wearing the national team jersey of Bafana Bafana, the men's national team, the yellow jersey. And this was, again, across class lines, across uh, racial lines. This is a picture I took uh, after the World Cup before friendly between South Africa and the United States in Cape Town, not a particularly passionate uh, soccer town in some ways. But what I 
the reason I picked this photo is the number of white um, South Africans wearing the national team jersey is really striking. This is not a scene you would have come across uh, before the World Cup, where very few among the white South Africans were really uh, committed, passionate soccer fans. They tend to uh, prefer uh, rugby, cricket, motorsports, uh, and, and other sports that are not soccer. But this had changed. And it really, I think, symbolically showed that unity, that pride uh, in the population. And I think this uh, really had a magical explosion in the opening game of the uh, World Cup on June 11th. And I'm gonna show you the clip of the goal scored by Shabalala in early in the second half against Mexico, uh, because it really captures the euphoria of that moment. Let me see if I can remember to share this properly. Just led the charge in South Africa. Marquez. Taylor. What do you say? It's a really good ball. It's Shabalala. Brings chills uh, back. Uh, amazing, amazing moment here. Okay, so, you know, like people dancing in the street, dogs barking. It was like South Africa had won the World Cup, not just scored a goal. And um, let me just stop the share here for a moment. Excuse me. Sorry, I'm getting lost a little bit in the multimedia. Um, the... Importance of this uh, uh, goal, uh, unfortunately, was diluted by the fact that uh, Mexico tied uh, about 15, 20 minutes later, uh, regrettably. Uh, but South Africa still patted itself on the back. This is uh, my family celebrating with our hosts uh, right after the game ended. Even though it was a 1-1 draw, you can see the, the, the beaming smiles and the uh, sporting patriotism on display here. And I think this really captures how most of the nation felt that uh, winter day. So, you know, from a political and symbolic standpoint, it was a big success. But in terms of the impact on South Africa um, of the tournament that was not such a success, um, we just look at the economics. And the economics speak pretty clearly that they were flawed. Uh, $6.5 billion US roughly spent in public money for stadiums and infrastructure. Uh, FIFA walked away with $2.3 billion in tax-free profits, and South Africa received about 250,000 tourists uh, who added about 0 0.4 to GDP. So they lost billions for what was essentially a month-long commercial for the country. Many of the stadiums are used very little or not at all, uh, so they're in danger of becoming white elephants. And two stadiums stand out in this process. One is the giant bedpan. Uh, of Greenpoint Stadium, a beautiful glossy uh, facility in central Cape Town, right next to the most visited tourist attraction in South Africa, the Victoria and Alfred waterfront. And the stadium was built there uh, because FIFA wanted it there. They wanted that nice aerial shot of the um, uh, Table Bay on the Atlantic Ocean side of Cape Town with Table Mountain in the background. And that's what they got. 60,000 seat stadium uh, for a city where professional matches usually attract uh, approximately four to 5,000 spectators. And so you know, I even published an editorial in the uh, Cape Town Argus, uh, basically saying that, you know, I had been arguing against building such a stadium uh, because it would have no purpose after the World Cup. 
And um, indeed, it's, it's turned out to be a, a financial loss of massive proportions. And I wrote in this op-ed that the difference between using the existing uh, rugby stadium at Newlands or the smaller soccer stadium in the proletarian side of town in Athlone uh, would uh, equal about the money needed to uh, build houses for about 250,000 poor folks. Uh, so I also said, you know, Cape Tonians are likely to incur uh, tax increases and cuts in social spending in the near future as the municipality struggles to find revenue to pay for the stadium's annual maintenance costs. So, you know, South Africa got played. Now, uh, the stadium is essentially the world's most expensive golf hazard. There's a small, um, used to be a nine hole golf course. Now I think it's seven holes, but... Um, in Durban, about a thousand miles up the coast, you've got uh, the extraordinary situation where a, a $450 million stadium was built with an iconic arch resembling that of Wembley, uh, the new Wembley in London, uh, across the street from an existing perfectly functional 52,000 seat rugby stadium. And so now Durban has the distinction of being the only other city other than Buenos Aires, Argentina with two 50,000 plus capacity stadiums across the street from each other. Uh, almost needless to say, uh, these two stadiums don't see much action. There's no need for two gigantic stadiums next to each other. And um, teams from Johannesburg are often brought in to play in Durban just to fill the stadium. Uh, took this picture during the Brazil-Portugal game, which was the hottest ticket of the first round. Everyone wanted to see uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, a young Cristiano Ronaldo, and also uh, Kaká from Brazil and, and other stars. And uh, it was a beautiful carnivalesque uh, feast, although it was more fun in the stands than on the pitch. It was a nil-nil draw. And this is the same grandstand two months later, the opening day of the South African Premier Soccer League between local club Abanzulu versus uh, their provincial rivals, Meritsburg United, 5,000 people in attendance in a 60,000 plus seat stadium. So these are, these are concerns, the, the, the financial aspects of hosting the World Cup. Uh, there are others. I don't have time to get into the details because I want to get to the other uh, uh, points that before we go to the Q&A. But, you know, one of the key things in the contracts that the host nations have to abide by that FIFA makes them sign is that basically uh, there are some ad hoc laws that local uh, political authorities need to pass in order to host um, the World Cup. And one of the things that they're doing here, for example, is granting FIFA officials uh, diplomatic uh, uh, passports, essentially, something that, you know, probably not even the Pope gets. And so, you know, FIFA officials can go in and out of, of the host nation without having to show, um, you know, the passports that you and I have to show and go through immigration. There's also, uh, they can take money in and out of the country, um, almost at will, and, and there's some other things. But even more worrisome is the fact that in the FIFA stadiums and fan zones, the official fan parks, uh, essentially local constitutional rights are suspended. And uh, this, this is a real concern for Qatar 2022 as well, uh, where if you don't have your fan ID, um, you could run into some serious problems. We'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, the stadiums in South Africa did not represent South African soccer culture at all. Uh, it was a very corporate, um, somewhat you know, artificial atmosphere which is why I think the Vuvuzela became such a, a, a controversial uh, object. Um, fans basically were, you know, giving the middle finger to FIFA by blowing the Vuvuzela and messing up the broadcast, um, live broadcasts. And, uh, you know, most of the fans who were going to the games also were much wealthier than the average South African fan. But, uh, you know, if you like soccer and you're a practitioner, you also want to see the World Cup benefit the grassroots. And we saw none of that in South Africa. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move forward here uh, to point out also that the South African women's team has done much better than the men's teams. Um, and they receive very little funding and almost no media attention, by the way. So let's turn now to close to Brazil, Russia, and Qatar and their spectacles of power. Uh, just a few months after the 2010 World Cup finished, uh, FIFA assigned the 2018 and 2022 World Cups to Russia and Qatar simultaneously. 
And this was very, very controversial. There were immediately um, allegations of corruption, something that FIFA, of course, uh, was no stranger to. There had been similar allegations in previous um, bid competitions. But Qatar, a tiny uh, Gulf nation getting the World Cup, was really um, quite extraordinary. And uh, indeed, the Department of Justice, uh, the FBI in particular, conducted uh, raids in Miami and also in Zurich um, as part of their investigation of corruption at FIFA. And they arrested many, many FIFA officials. I think two thirds, in fact, of the individuals who voted uh, for Qatar to host the World Cup in 2022 uh, were ensnared in this investigation. Uh, many of them have been tried and, and convicted. But uh, you can consult all of these documents uh, if you go to the um, U.S. Uh, District Court for, um, what is it, e uh, the Eastern District of New York, and you can consult all of the documents related to these investigations. Um, you could fill a library with the books um, that have been written about this, uh, starting with Andrew Jennings' famous uh, expose, uh, going all the way to the recently released FIFA Uncovered Netflix series, which borrows heavily uh, from David Cohn's uh, own work. And I just saw the first episode of FIFA Uncovered, and, and it's pretty good. I mean, there's not a lot that's new to for experts, but it really does a nice job of summarizing uh, the story and, and bringing it to life. And in that documentary, you also learn about characters like Mohammed bin Amam, who was a FIFA vice president when Qatar was bidding for the World Cup, who was alleged to have bought votes of the FIFA executive committee members who at the time voted to award uh, the World Cup hosting rights. And the evidence is pretty substantial. Uh, there are leaked emails by a FIFA whistleblower um, there were attachments with bank transactions, minutes of meetings, uh, lots of confidential files, even travel expenses. Uh, the scandal was such that Bin Amam had to resign from his position in 2012. In the midst of these investigations, by the way, it emerged that South Africa itself uh, was likely to have paid a substantial bribe um, to the tune of $10 million US uh, to secure the votes of uh, Caribbean countries. We have almost two dozen votes um, in the process of awarding the World Cup. And so they called it the Diaspora Legacy Program. That was the euphemism used uh, to explain why South Africa uh, was paying these $10 million to uh, the Caribbean nations voting in the competition. And so under the weight of this corruption scandal, Sepp Blatter, who had been president for uh, two decades, uh, had to resign, and he was replaced by Gianni Infantino, who initiated a, a, a Swiss of Italian background, who initiated a program of mild reforms. And um, don't expect FIFA to suddenly become a transparent, transparent, accountable, you know, organization. That's not going to happen anytime soon. In fact, uh, in 2014, when the World Cup went to Brazil, one of the most infamous <laughs> quotes to come out of that uh, tournament was uh, uh, Jerome Falke, who was a high-ranking member of FIFA at the time, who said that uh, in the wake of all these massive public protests against public spending for the World Cup in Brazil, said less democracy is sometimes preferable to organize a World Cup. Well, he knew what he was talking about, of course, because in 2018, the World Cup went to Russia, and uh, there's Vladimir Putin next to Gianni Infantino caressing in a kind of creepy way uh, very Putinesque way, the um, seven kilogram gold trophy designed by an Italian sculptor, by the way, right before the final. And, uh, you know, this was an opportunity for Russia to present itself to the world as it had in 2014 in Sochi as, as you know, uh, a kind of um, benevolent power in the world. And uh, even at home, some of the, the um, tougher security uh, measures that Putin employs to uh, keep the lid on protest and dissent and, and political opponents uh, were, were set aside for the 30 days or so of the tournament. And of course, in 2022, uh, six days from today, uh, the World Cup will kick off in the Persian Gulf nation of Qatar. And uh, Rory Smith, the main uh, soccer writer in the New York Times, who's actually uh, English, uh, I think he's based in Liverpool, um, wrote in September the following, 
this is the World Cup as Qatar envisages it, and seemingly as FIFA does too, a premium product, a lifestyle experience that can be acquired at a certain price point, a playground for the corporate class, the itinerant rich, the luxury traveler. It is an event designed by consultants for consultants, the sort of place in which a gigantic fire-breathing spider imported from the UK, I believe, is hired to disguise in spectacle the absence of sensation. And I want to leave you with uh, three final points. The first is that Mandela's rainbow nationalism ended up equating sports development in South Africa with hosting these massive mega events. The World Cup, the Men's World Cup in 2010 was the biggest, but they also hosted uh, the Rugby World Cup earlier, the Cricket World Cup, and other major international events. 2010 really saw South Africa rent itself out to FIFA for a month-long party that generated, yes, emotional rewards, symbolic rewards, you can even say PR rewards, but at a massive financial cost to the host nation. Brazil 2014 really highlighted Brazilian citizens' opposition to wasteful public spending for these kinds of sporting mega events. You know that in 2016, Rio also hosted the Olympics. So this was, this was very much the forefront of people's minds uh, and in Brazilian politics. I would argue that this had something to do also with uh, the rise of Bolsonaro, uh, the far right president who thankfully just recently lost um, his election um, to Lula. Uh, and so with Russia 2018 and then Qatar 22, uh, FIFA was really concerned about protecting its cash cow, the Men's World Cup, and did so by enabling these authoritarian regimes, these undemocratic regimes, to project their soft power, to launder their reputation, i.e. sports washing, and to create a kind of alternative fictional self, not just for the international community, but also for domestic consumption. And so in the end, I think what we have with these World Cup mega events is a paradox. They strengthen in the short term national pride. They raise the international visibility of the host nation. But at the same time, and with longer term consequences, they weaken host nation's willingness to expand access to sport and to address socioeconomic needs and the civil rights of their population. I don't want to leave you with a cynical sense here. And so I'll close with a quote from David Goldblatt's The Age of Football, when he points out that soccer is so much more unpredictable than other team sports. Most matches turn on a small number of chances and an even smaller number of goals. Football's entropy, giving underdogs a better chance, it is a game that thrives upon chaos and uncertainty that demands of individuals and collectives that they constantly adapt to an ever-changing milieu, and yet retains the notion that anything is possible. Sudden changes of heart and fortune, last minute reversals and rescues are its true ludic and emotional currency. It's hard to imagine a game so unsuited to the inflexible sclerosis of authoritarian regimes. It is equally hard to imagine a form of play so well suited to serve an, as an avatar of our collective human dilemmas and so suggestive of the virtues we might need to tackle them. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Peter. That was wonderful. Um, if people have questions, they can now raise their hand using the the icon, or you can also post your question in the uh, in the chat box. And while everybody's having a think, Peter, I'm going to ask you a quick question, if I may, which is to say, <clears throat> when you talk about the impacts of um, the game. Hosting the World Cup in, in South Africa 2010, the lack of um, benefits that we've seen in terms of the grassroots game in Africa, to what extent is that also driven by what seems to me to be the sort of increasing dominance of European leagues, and particularly the Premier League as a product as well, which is 
um, perhaps making it less. I don't know whether that financially it is more difficult for fans to get to games, but also the, the, the sort of spectacle of, of the Premier League, which of course also recruits so many talented players from, from Africa, um, is perhaps a, a, a growing concern when we also think about the fact that at the last World Cup, of course, at that World Cup, you had Ghana in the quarters and on the cusp of a semi-final. In the last World Cup, I think none of the African teams made, made it out of the, the group stages. To what extent is that a, a factor in this um, and, and a concern as well? Really good question. The exodus of talent from not just South Africa, but especially North Africa and West Africa and Central Africa to the European leagues and beyond. Even Asia is now a, a, a real destination for many uh, African players. That is diluting the talent base at home. No question about it. Uh, when the top youth and also some of the more um, experienced players choose for very good reasons, mostly financial ones, frankly, uh, to go to... Uh, leagues and clubs that pay them a much better wage yeah i mean local fans you know they they don't want to see uh, mediocre football and so the migration of players uh, does undermine uh, the the talent base at home uh, another factor of course is that the grassroots development becomes less focused on producing players for domestic leagues and tends to become um, more attracted to just exporting talent. They become kind of a, a producers in a commodity chain, if you will. Now, there are advantages to that in the sense that lots of local people, including in South Africa, become talent scouts or you know, try to become intermediaries so that they can um, sell rights to agents or you know, to clubs that are scouting. And so they can make a buck, uh, often a quick buck at the expense of a young, you know, starry-eyed kid. Uh, but that does happen. And so it's not, you know, there is an inequality there and there is an extractive relationship that benefits Europe at the expense of uh, African countries, no, no doubt about it, but there is also opportunity there. And the opportunity is again, um, for the most talented youngsters to actually make it, you know, one in 10,000 do make it, uh, which is roughly the, the average, you know, uh, for making the MBA as well from top programs um, in the United States uh, college system, roughly. Um, but also for these, these other figures who insert themselves. Uh, you see the same thing in the Dominican Republic with baseball talents, you know, the Buscones and others who are able to build these relationship with major league uh, franchises and, and minor league um, structures. And so, yeah, uh, in the big picture, Africa loses out and grassroots development gets reoriented towards the export market rather than, than locally. But also, you know, African fans are very sophisticated and, you know, they like to watch good football and they're very proud when, you know, their stars make it in the big leagues, whether it's the Premier League or, or other big leagues in Europe. And sometimes when they come back to their national team, they're, they're better players. And so that's also a kind of hidden benefit to this. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't translated into a World Cup success uh, yet, but hopefully in the near future. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Hill, I can see there's a hand there, and then we'll go to some questions in the chat. Hey, Peter. Uh, thanks for Hi, being Tom. here today. Um, so I'd just be curious to hear your opinion, or if you have an opinion, um, kind of on the morality of the average person watching this World Cup in Qatar, considering the uh, migrant labor issues and the uh, alleged slave labor that was used to build the infrastructure for this tournament. Ah, uh, the, the, the ethics of consumption, that's a big topic. Um, hmm. I'll admit to something, which is it's easier to take the moral high ground if your team hasn't qualified. So that's, that's, that's my position as a kind of, you know, lefty academic. I, I, it, it's a little bit easier for me to, to take the moral high ground. Um, but um, it is a concern, of course. And I think it's very problematic um, that Qatar, you know, is, a, is not a democratic uh, state and that it has specific laws that target uh, various uh, 
um, individuals who have, for example, a different sexual orientation. Uh, it also has very limited uh, freedom of assembly and speech, you know, liberties that we sometimes take for granted now uh, in our part of the world. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Amnesty International has reported extensively on this, The Guardian in, in the UK as well. And I think FIFA has blood on its hands as much as Qatar. And, you know, my, my take on this is that um, the World Cup should take place in the same space every four years. I think they should build a kind of Disney, uh, Disneyland of soccer and just have it there. There's no point in having, you know, Qatar allegedly spent $250 billion to host this, uh, killed at least 6,000 uh, people. Amnesty actually claims 15,000. It's hard to know because of the way that, quote unquote, natural deaths are categorized. Um, but that would not happen, in my opinion, if there was a dedicated hosting space for the World Cup. It would be much more efficient from an economic perspective. Uh, its carbon footprint would be far, far smaller. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 I don't look to sports for my, for my moral lessons. Um, unlike, who was it, Camus, who said that everything he learned about morality, he learned from football. I, I think that was a tongue-in-cheek comment, you know, kind of like Shankly's uh, famous quote about um, what was it? Um, football is, uh, is is not as important as what, what was it? Um, help me, Stephen. It, it's not a matter of life. Not though. a matter of life and death. It's much more important than that. Yeah, that was obviously intended as a joke, and then people didn't understand the joke. Kind of like social media these days. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm, I'm terribly disappointed at FIFA, for example, not backing, you know, Denmark's um, uh, desire to wear the, the, jer the tra training jersey with the human rights uh, statement. I mean, here you have FIFA who keeps on babbling about their support for human rights and, and civil rights. And then here's an opportunity for them to actually practice what they preach. And instead, they prohibited uh, Denmark from wearing these training jerseys. I mean, that's that's just atrocious. Um, so, uh, I mean, FIFA is a cesspool. I don't know how else to put it. It's 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 an organization that is not reformable. It's not rescuable. I think it should be completely uh, disintegrated, demolished, eliminated from from the face of the earth and something new needs to be built. Um, so that's my take on the morality of the World Cup. And, um, you know, I also would caution Westerners not to get too arrogant about, you know, sort of uh, host nations outside of the Western core. Um, we have to be careful, you know, from our privileged position, not to come out like, you know, we, we've got the perfect societies with all the answers to all these problems, because uh, we certainly have our own share of challenges. Uh, and we have very strong, you know, extremist um, uh, organizations and, and uh, individuals who are becoming increasingly visible and powerful. So, um, yeah, I, I don't want to I don't want to turn, you know, Qatar into like our own sort of morality play. Um, but I also would hope that people appreciate what's going on and, and the blood that has been spilled and the lives that have been lost to put on this this circus. So I'm glad you raised it. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, looking to the chat, Peter, I can see that people are interested in the 2026 World Cup. Um, <clears throat> your uh, early thoughts on that, someone uh, has written about, you know, why is it, uh, given how you've highlighted the, the financial um, losses associated with uh, South Africa hosting the the World Cup in 2010, which seems to be a, a common story for many other sporting mega events. Uh, why did the United States, Canada, and Mexico lobby so hard to win their bid? And do you expect a different outcome here? Um, Shashank, who's in my class, is saying, you know, will we, you know, there's a lack of, of grassroots football development here, like a free accessible football and football clubs, this sort of franchise model, which separates communities from uh, from uh, their the teams sometimes. Will anything change uh, in that sense, do you think, from hosting the World Cup with this sort of joint bid for 2026? 
Wow, excellent questions. Uh, the United States was bidding against Qatar for, for 2022. I mean, you know, Qatar beat the U.S. I mean, that, that is pretty extraordinary. Uh, so the U.S. has been trying to get the World Cup, um, you know, back since uh, hosting it in 1994 for, for some time. Um, I think the cost equation is different for the U.S., because of the remarkable sporting infrastructure that the U.S. can boast. I mean, there, I'm not sure how many new stadiums are going to be built, if any, in the U.S., and that's a big part of the expense. Um, so, you know, with the recent um, boom in, in MLS stadium uh, construction, I don't even think they need to build all that many training facilities either. So yeah, I don't think the U.S. Uh, case is really comparable to, to many others. I think the U.S. case maybe might be more comparable to Germany 2006. Uh, they did build uh, a few stadiums there, but some of them were renovations and the cost uh, of hosting it were, were uh, much more limited. I think the costs are much higher in, in, in countries that are poor, who are extremely keen on showcasing these so-called world-class facilities. You know. Uh, they're buying a month-long commercial for their country, and, and they often don't have the infrastructure that a wealthy, powerful nation like the U.S. has. So I think from a cost standpoint, it's not going to be uh, comparable to what we've talked about today. So in terms of its, um, what's interesting is the co-hosting arrangement with Mexico and Canada, you know, kind of a NAFTA <laughs> of soccer, if you will. And I'm interested to see how that's going to play out. Um, although most of the games, about two thirds of the games, including the the, the prized final, are going to be in the U.S., um, it's going to be a forty eight team tournament as well. And how many nations in the world can host a forty eight team forty eight team World Cup? I mean, it's it's going to be really difficult to to find. Uh, from 2030 on, I don't know how they're going to manage. I think the co-hosting arrangement is, is likely to become more of the norm. So we'll see how, how that works out. In terms of its impact on grassroots development in the States, uh, I'm not sure. I'm a historian, so I'm not an economist. I'm glad because uh, most of my predictions also, like economists, um, turn out to be wrong. But... In 1994, the World Cup did jumpstart what we're seeing today, sort of, you know, the evolution of soccer in this country to the point where it's essentially the number three uh, major league sport. I mean, you know, um, alongside, well, behind uh, certainly college and NFL football, behind basketball and baseball, but only slightly. So, uh, sorry, number four then, but ahead of hockey. I mean, ice hockey is, a. I, I know, you know, saying this to a Wisconsin audience, like when I say it to my Michigan student, Michigan State students, you know, they kind of recoil, but ice hockey is, is a regional sport, frankly. Um, so yeah, so soccer, soccer has really uh, elevated itself at the professional level. Now, you've got development structures now in the US that also have professionalized, and you have MLS teams with academies, and several of those academies, they no longer charge a fee uh, to attend. So they're looking more and more, in fact, like European professional club academies. The problem is how you get there. And how you get there, of course, is pay to play in most cases. Not only that, the way you get there is most commonly through suburban, you know, upper middle class or even, you know, upper class uh, sports structures. It's, it's quite difficult for, you know, a poor working class uh, Latino kid, for example, to make it in the U.S. soccer structures. I don't see the 2026 World Cup really revolutionizing that. Uh, I think what we're going to see is a continuation of what we see today with this very strong U.S. men's national team, and that is a very diverse team. Uh, it's less white than probably ever before in its history, and I'm very encouraged by that. However, a lot of the players are coming through, you know, the structures I just mentioned. And so, you know, is the U.S. really drawing from uh, its very deep and diverse talent pool as effectively as it could? I don't think we're there yet. And I'm not sure that 2026 is going to change that dramatically. 
Uh, I hope I'm wrong. Um, now, the women's game, of course, raises all sorts of other questions because I think there's there's an even greater challenge there to, to really reach the um, diversity of talent that's available in, in the U.S. But yeah, that's a, that's a short answer to a really good set of questions that probably require a whole other seminar to address. Indeed, we'll have to have you back, Peter. Um, but I can see that, that, that right now we are at time, and I know that where you are, it's uh, 10.30 at night now, just gone? Just about. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to, to, to uh, talk with us. Um, before you go, can you pick a winner for this World Cup for us? <laughs> you, you've already gone on record as saying your predictions never work out, so it's okay. Correct, correct. My, so please uh, keep that in mind. Um, I'll say Argentina. That's my 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 head says Argentina and my heart says uh, Senegal. All right. That'll do for me. I'll take an Argentina Senegal final. Peter, thank you once again so so much. I can see lots of people are leaving there. The thanks for you in the um uh, in the chat here as well. And um yeah, it's been a thank pleasure. Thank you everyone. Thanks for the great questions and the conversation. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Peace.